Welcome back everybody and in this video I'm going to be showing you exactly how to get a band 7 or higher. This is a really important video because many students don't get the band score they think they should because they don't know what the examiners are looking for. This makes it difficult for them to produce a good answer for the IELTS examiners. So in this lesson, I'll be showing you exactly what the examiners want and how you can give it to them. Right, let's begin. So how do you give the examiners what they want? Well, first of all, you have to accept that you are playing a game here. You are playing the IELTS game and what you have to work out is what you have to do and what you should not do to impress the examiners. You then need to work out your areas of weakness and improve on those areas through practice and studying the band descriptors. In front of you now you have the IELTS Writing Task 1 band descriptors and they are slightly different to the essay writing task. In the table here, as you can see, we've got the different band descriptors along the top, task achievement, coherence and cohesion, lexical resource and grammatical range and accuracy. And down the side, we've got the different bands that you can get. Right at the top, a nine, eight, down to a seven, six, and we could go on down to five, four, three, two, one, um, but Obviously, we're aiming for much higher than that. And I'm going to be showing you or targeting a band 7 or higher. So let's take a look at these specific boxes in more detail now. The first band descriptor we're going to take a look at is task achievement. And this basically means have you answered the question correctly? So the examiners want to see that you have actually summarized the main features of the visual data that you've been shown. So how are we going to do that? Well, as you can see, you're required to write an overview of the main trends, differences or stages and we'll be doing that by writing a clear overview in our first paragraph. Secondly, we'll be presenting our key features in our details paragraphs. So we'll be specifically having a paragraph all about our key features in our details paragraphs. We will of course be writing 150 words as that is what the question asks you to do and that is why it's part of the task achievement band uh, criteria as well. So word count is important. Um, and you should also not write about too many different things. Remember it says key features which means we're picking out the main or most important features so we're not writing about lots of different things. It's certainly not a list that we're writing. We're also going to avoid numbers or details in your overview paragraph. An overview gives the general idea of something which does not require uh, details. So we're not going to include details in our overview paragraph. We're also not going to include an opinion. As you can see, the task achievement, nowhere in there is it asking for your opinion. We don't need to know why you think a trend has gone up or decreased or what you think will happen in the future. That is all your opinion and is not required. You will save your opinion for the essays, um, but certainly do not include your opinion. Uh, in IELTS writing task one. You'll also not going to be writing a conclusion uh, in task one. It's not required. Um, you've only got 150 to 200 words to write and 
in a summary task like this our overview is basically doing the same job as what a conclusion would do so we would only be repeating the same information so we're simply going to focus on writing a clear overview in our first paragraph so therefore we don't need to be including a conclusion so those are the things you need to do and not do if you want to get a band 7 uh, for task achievement. Coherence and cohesion is our next band criteria to take a look at and this basically is asking if your answer is logical, understandable and easy to read and does your writing flow correctly. Here is the band descriptor for band 7 and as you can see it's asking you to logically organize information and ideas. We will be doing that by using an appropriate structure and I'll be showing you that structure in future videos. This will also help us to logically organize our information and that's really what coherence is all about. Um, making sure our paragraphs fit together sensibly. You also need to be using a range of cohesive devices. This just means that you're using different linking words or phrases that help to link your sentences and paragraphs together. These are words such as however, even though, although, first of all, uh, after that, uh, secondly, words, words like that are all cohesive devices or linking words. So it's important we use a range of those and that we just don't repeat the same ones all the time, which often students might use and also, and also, and also. We need to avoid that. We also need to use pronouns accurately when referencing. Um, this is pr pronouns we use instead of repeating the main noun of a sentence. So instead of saying um, the level of car vehicle ownership increases and then the level of car ownership decreases and then the level of car ownership drops even further, instead of repeating car ownership, we would refer to it as it and that is called referencing and we need to do that accurately throughout our answers. You'll be seeing more examples of this during the course. Now a few things not to do if you want to score highly for coherence and cohesion are first you must not forget to paragraph. Writing in paragraphs is essential as it's how we logically organize ideas and information. And as you can see, that is a key part of coherence and cohesion. So you must write in paragraphs. You must also not use too many linking words. If you use too many linking words, this can uh, make your answer sound a bit unnatural. Um, now, so it's a balance. You need to get a balance of how many linking words you need. Um, but you don't want to be adding them in for no reason. You'll be seeing some good example essays, um, or sorry, some good example answers that you can get an idea of how many you should be using. Finally, you don't always need to make comparisons. Um, the question does ask you to make comparisons, but um, where appropriate. So that means you don't always need to make comparisons and sometimes it might not even make sense to make comparisons. So if you tried to make comparisons when it wasn't appropriate, then that would make your answer less coherent, which means understandable. So that's an overview of how to get a band 7 for coherence and cohesion. Let's take a look at the next band criteria. The third band descriptor is lexical resource or 
how good is your vocabulary? And to measure this, the examiners want to see a range of vocabulary. So try and put variety into your vocabulary by not using the same words over and over again to describe the data. The other thing you need to do is use vocabulary that's relevant and specific to the data that you're describing. So to describe a pie chart, you want to use different words than those you would use to describe a flow chart or those you would use to describe uh, a bar chart. So using specific vocabulary makes it relevant to the task and also means that sometimes the vocabulary you use is less common and these less common words uh, will naturally score you higher in the test. You also need to use words that fit together naturally. Words such as um, increase significantly or decrease dramatically. Those pairs of words fit together very naturally and it's what native speakers would write or say. So you need to be using those types of combinations to sound natural and that is called collocation. Throughout the course all the example answers will be using collocations and you should make notes on these two or three word phrases that are used and go and use them yourself in your own answers. A few things not to do. Um, don't use so many different words that you start making mistakes. Some students get tempted into thinking that if they just write lots and lots of different words, they're going to score more highly. Um, this is a mistake because you still need to be concise and clear in your answers. And obviously writing lots and lots of different words for no reason is not going to improve your answer. As I've mentioned, don't repeat words if, if it's possible. Always try and use a very close synonym if you can. Um, this isn't always possible, so don't worry if you have to use the same word again. It's better to be accurate than to use a word that you're not sure whether it's a direct synonym or not. Also, don't just add in overly complicated words. Um, again, students think this will make them look good if they use very long words. It doesn't work that way. It has to be words that fit naturally into what you are trying to say. Be careful with your spelling as well. IELTS does assess your spelling and don't make any basic spelling mistakes. Um, this will obviously decrease your score. Um, likewise, don't make basic errors with word formation. For example, the word significant, you could also have significance and also significantly. So there's at least three different word formations for that word and you need to use the correct one for the sentence you're writing. For example, the level of car ownership has decreased significantly or to use the word significant, you would say there has been a significant decrease in the level of car ownership. Each time the word formation and therefore the spelling is slightly different. So it's important that you get this correct when you're writing your answer as well. And finally, go with the 100% rule. That means if you're not sure if a word is correct to use or not, then don't use it. Only use the words that you are sure about in the test. When you're doing the test, it is not the time to be experimenting with different words. The test is the time to use the words that you do know and do the best that you can um, with the words that you do have being as accurate as you possibly can with your spelling, word formation and grammar. So 
always go with the 100% rule. If you're not sure about a word or a particular phrase, then please don't use it. When you do your practice leading up to the test, that is when you can experiment with different word choices and get feedback. But the test is the time where you only use the words that you are correct, that you know are correct. Okay, that's enough on lexical resource. And finally, the fourth marking criteria is grammar. So how good is your grammar? So here we see that you need to try and use a variety of complex structures. Now, that often scares students in that they've got to use a variety of complex structures, but it really needn't. You will be writing complex sentences and you won't even know you're doing it. So don't worry about this complex structure idea. Um, it basically means any sentence that includes a linking word such as and, however, therefore. If you're using those words, you're writing complex sentences. There are many ways to write complex sentences and you will be doing this naturally anyway. But I will be showing you some good examples of complex structures that you can use. Um, so this should help you score highly in this part. You also um, don't f force yourself to put in complex structures. Use only the grammar you need for the task. You simply need to answer the question as concisely as you can. Try and be as accurate as you can with the grammar that you know. So focus on your accuracy um, so that everything you write is as accurate as it possibly can be. Identify your common errors. So find out what are the errors that you often make through getting feedback from teachers or native speakers and work on improving them. Always check your work. It's a good idea to check each sentence as you write it. So write a sentence and then check it there and then. And then go on to your next sentence. So check each sentence as you go as well as at the end. And finally, don't deliberately try to use certain tenses or structures. So as I said, don't try and add in different structures or tenses just to try and make it look better. It doesn't work like that. It makes it look unnatural and uh, will often lower your band score. And finally, uh, I know it's pressurized in the, on test day, but do check your answer at the end just for simple mistakes that you might be easily able to correct. Let's now look at a quick summary of everything we've learnt in this video. So firstly, you need to be aware of the marking criteria. You need to know what the examiners want so you can give it to them. So that includes everything I've just mentioned in the previous four slides. You might want to go back and listen to them again so you know exactly what the examiners are looking for. One of the main things the examiners are looking for is an effective structure. This helps you to organize your answer and your thoughts and helps you get a good score in task achievement as well as coherence and cohesion. And it's really important that you use the structure that I will give you in a future video. Focus on accuracy first. Don't worry about adding all your own things. Just focus on using the skills that you do have and being as accurate as you can. Also, try and identify your own areas of weakness and work on them as you get towards the exam. And think about these things when viewing model answers. So you're going to see lots of different model answers by the end of the course. and I want you to think about those four different marking criteria and why and how those answers score highly for them. So if you start thinking like an examiner, think about what they're looking for 
of those four band criteria and how each answer is giving that to them. Okay, that's enough for this video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.